So today uh, we have uh, Dr. Max Zimit from uh, Center for the Fundamental Laws of Nature High Energy Theory Group uh, from Harvard University. Uh, he's a postdoc there, and uh, uh, this is your first postdoc, I think. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you did your he did the PhD from Stanford University with uh, uh, Shamit Kachru, and uh, he's going to talk about a, a recent work uh, which he had written with Shamit itself. Uh, it is about K3 matrices. So please, uh, Max, you can start from your end. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and more generally for running this seminar. Uh, this is a uh, very good service for the community. Uh, all right, uh, let me get started. So, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, Okay, so Clavier compactification has played a central role in string theory. Uh, and the general reason for that is because reduced holonomy uh, le leads to low energy supersymmetry um, when you compactify string theory on a, on a manifold with reduced holonomy, you get low energy supersymmetry. Um, and type two compactifications preserve 4D n equals two supersymmetry and are the natural setting of mirror symmetry. Uh, heterotic and orientifold compactifications preserve 4dn equals 1 and have provided semi-realistic starting points for string phenomenology. And they're also the setting in which much of our non-perturbative non understanding of string theory has been developed, so string dualities uh, in particular. Um, uh, and amongst Calabia manifolds, K3 has played a particularly important role. Um, as essentially the simplest non-trivial kalabi yao manifold. So uh, it, it's a four-dimensional, four-real-dimensional manifold. Um, and in four real dimensions, the only uh, examples are, are K3 and T4. And uh, because of this accidental isomorphism between SU2 and SP1, uh, the, um, in, in four dimensions, kalabi yao is the same as being hyperkähler. Uh, and that, that will prove very useful in this talk to take use, uh, make, make use of this um, extra structure. Um, and, and a very concrete way to think about K3 that will be useful later is uh, as, a, as the resolution of a T4 mod Z2 orbifold. So if you think of T4 as being R4 mod some lattice, uh, then, uh, it, then the Z2 just acts by negating the four coordinates of R4. Um, and, and that has 16 fixed points. Uh, so zero is obvious, and then the half translations along all, of, all the four different basis vectors give you uh, two to the four um, other fixed points. Um, well, two to the four total fixed points. Uh, and, and so those fixed points give you singularities in, in the orbifold, fold, and, and then you resolve those uh, by, by essentially gluing in an aguchi hansen manifold, and that gives you a smooth K3 surface. Uh, si since K3 is hyperkähler, it preserves even more supersymmetry th than uh, a typical Clavier threefold. And so, what I mean by that is uh, K3 times C2 has n equals four supersymmetry. Uh, and heterotic uh, type two duality uh, plays an essential role in our understanding of how the various superstring theories are related. So, uh, and, and then you can get dualities with less supersymmetry, for example, by fibering this duality over a P1 base uh, to find uh, dual uh, compactifications on threefolds. Uh, and uh, this is the earliest, the, the setting for the earliest example of black hole microstate counting in string theory by Strom and Durbapa. So uh, K3 has played a very central role in, in, uh, in string theory is the point of these slides. And remarkably, all of this was achieved without an explicit form of the metric, which is uh, sort of funny because the metric is the main defining data of the string, string compactification. Um, the, the, you know, the fact that your solution of the Einstein equations is a very important aspect of Clavial manifolds. Um, and indeed, no smooth, compact, non-toroidal, rich, flat Clavial metric is known. 
So Ritchie flat just being solution of vacuum Einstein equations. And why might this matter to a string theorist? Well, supposedly the uh, way you define a perturbative string vacuum is you start from a CFT, such as a nonlinear sigma model with this action. Uh, this is one of the first things that we see in, in uh, string theory courses. But in reality, since we don't have, have the metric, this formulation is rather useless. Um, so it's a sort of funny aspect of how we learn uh, string theory that this is one of the first things we see. But in, in many cases that have been uh, the focus of the most attention, uh, we, we don't actually have this, uh, ha have a handle on, on, on this approach. Um, and this question is particularly well motivated for K3 as opposed to other Clavier manifolds because the beta function is exactly zero. Uh, and as an ex example of our ignorance, even for K3, which is you know, very well studied uh, and the one of the simplest uh, Clavier manifolds, the, the world sheet partition function is not known at almost all points in moduli space. So, you know, we, we can compute indices at nice points in moduli space, and those are the same everywhere, like the elliptic genus, but the partition function itself is, is almost nowhere known. Uh, so I'm gonna describe to you in this talk uh, explicit, an explicit construction of K3 metrics um, based on recent work with these two well-dressed collaborators. Uh, and indeed, we have uh, not one, but two constructions. Um, one of them is completely explicit, and one of them, there, there, there are some missing in integer uh, invariants. Um, so we, we've reduced, from, from that point of view, we've reduced the problem from a, a differential geometry one which, problem, which is rather tricky, to an algebraic geometry problem, which is still uh, tricky, but, but um, w within the realm of solvability. But, uh, but, because, but um, r rather than solving that algebraic geometry problem, I'm going to explain that you can actually uh, get extract those integer invariants from the other approach to constructing the metric instead. So, uh, yeah, th this this uh, I'll, I'll make clear what yeah, what so I mean by all of that. I want to ask people that since we going to the next section, if you have any question, please ask the speaker. Oh yeah, I, I should have said uh, please interrupt me. Uh, I went whenever you have a question uh, because. Um, yeah, please ask. Uh, hi. Uh, well, it's not really a question. It's more of a request. Uh, so, for example, I don't know about the other people in the audience, but I'm not an expert in string theory. So I have some, you know, uh, exposure to, for example, uh, the bosonic string. Uh, but I want to learn more. So I, I was hoping maybe at some point you could be a, a little bit more... Uh, uh, pedantic for you know uh, newcomers such as me in, in going over the some of the technical issues. Sure. Uh, so you can ask if you have any question, please ask. Uh, like he uh, just given an overview on the subject in which he, he wants to comment on or the, give the talk. So if you if you have any question, you please ask. He can discuss. Okay, I will do that. Yeah. Yeah, the details of perturbative string, string, string theory won't play an important role for the most part in this talk, but uh, I will, uh, you know, if the, if uh, like, like these big picture ideas about um, Calabi out compactification, I can say a bit more about it if, if that would help. Uh, uh, yeah, that would definitely help. Okay, maybe the easiest way to think about this is from the low energy supergravity point of view. Um, it, the, the same, same statements hold in that context where if you start with a, a 10 dimensional supergravity theory uh, and, and you can take, consider a, a solution of that, that, that theory uh, where space time factorizes as four dimensional Minkowski space, times a uh, compact six-dimensional calabi yau manifold um, that, that's uh, uh, be below the, the um, Kluza-Klein scale, which is the typical curvature scale set by the, uh, of the compact dimensions, then your theory is, is effectively four-dimensional. 
And so this is a sort of paradigmatic way of producing um, theories of four dimensional physics from, from 10 dimensional starting points. Uh, and uh, uh, so 10 dimensions is special because that's where perturbative, where, where uh, that, that, that's a natural starting point for perturbative string theory. Um, uh, right, no, I'm familiar with, uh, you know, supergravity as the low energy limit of type 2b and then, you know, the compactification procedure. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, that that's uh, all I need from string theory so far. Uh, I'll, I'll try to um, carefully introduce anything I need, but uh, yeah, please ask questions. Yeah, so like the, when you right now go on, so you just, uh, when you uh, mention something, you just uh, discuss it in a little bit detail because of the audience. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me now begin with the uh, uh, discussion of the first of the two constructions. I'll call this the Coulomb branch construction for reasons that will become clear. Um, so the physical context for this construction is what's called a little string theory. So uh, let, let me introduce that. Um, this is uh, the, the starting point physically is what's called a heterotic small instanton five brain. So uh, a heterotic string theory, let's, let's take SO32 for concreteness. Uh, ha has a SO32 gauge group in 10 dimensions. Uh, gauge theories have instantons solutions, which are, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, one way to think about them is as co-dimension four solitons, where uh, the, the um, in those four transverse dimensions, the uh, ga gauge field is, is taking on some, some interesting configuration which is a solution of the four-dimensional Euclidean Yang-Mills equations. Um, so so uh, th that, that's what I mean by an instanton. And what I mean by a small instanton is that uh, the, um, an, an instanton has a modulus, which is, uh, it, it's, well, it has many moduli, but it, one modulus in particular is the size of the instanton. And, and there's a small instanton limit where the, uh, the curvature of the, of the gauge bundle um, is, is concentrated at a single point. A and so away from that point, it, it looks like a, uh, like a trivial gauge field, but um, right at that point, it looks very singular. Uh, so this is a, a certain point at, at the origin of the moduli space of that instant time. And, and, uh, and so, at, at that small instanton singularity, from the from the supergravity point of view, this looks like a very singular configuration. But in string theory, that is a, a perfectly sensible configuration, and, and it it, it uh, behaves like a, a non-perturbative soliton, um, which is called a a, a five brain. Um, it's called a five brain because again, it, it the uh, you, you should think about the the five brain as being localized in the six dimensions transverse to the small instanton. Um, and these have a decoupling limit. What I mean by that is if I take G string to zero so that the, um, the, the bulk of the theory is not interacting anymore, I've turned off gravity, for example. Nevertheless, the, the five brain remains dynamical. And, and that sounds like a rather surprising statement, um, but from, there, there are a few different ways to understand this. One is that from the supergravity perspective, this soliton is extremely singular. And in particular, the, um, the description of this soliton in uh, supergravity doesn't just involve a, a divergent uh, uh, Ying-Mills connection. Uh, it, it also involves the, a divergent dilaton. So no matter what value you set the vacuum expectation value of the dilaton at infinity, uh, near near the core of the of the small instanton, the uh, the uh, the effect, local g string will be diverging, and so you you can set g string to zero at infinity if you'd like, but the theory will still remain interacting at the origin. Um, there are other ways to understand this. Another one is uh, uh, that the um, the at, at low energies, the, the world volume of an SO32 small instanton five brain is described by an SU2 gauge theory. 
uh, in six dimensions. And the gauge coupling of that uh, gauge theory it is simply set by the, the string scale, um, but no, no powers of G string. So it, it makes sense that the theory would remain interacting even in the G string to zero range. Uh, that, that is, you know, in contrast with D brain gauge theories with, where G string does show up. Um, it is not a quantum field theory. Uh, uh, for example, it has T duality, so there's no unique stress energy tensor because, you know, stress energy tensors tell you how you respond to changes in your background geometry. So if you don't have a unique background geometry, uh, then there's not a unique stress energy tensor. Okay, so we're gonna be interested in compactifying this small instanton five brain uh, and, and studying the moduli space of that five brain. So uh, the, there's a very nice way to see this geometrically in, via string dualities. Um, so let, let's again, for concreteness, focus on the SO32 theory. Um, the two different heterotic five brains are T-dual after we compactify on a circle. And so for our purposes, the two different heterotic five brains will, play, will be equally good. Um, so, so let's just focus on this one for concreteness. Um, so strong weak duality takes this SO32 heterotic theory uh, to type one, and the heterotic five brain becomes a D5 brain in type one string theory. A and now to study the moduli space of the theory on T2, uh, a, neat, a nice uh, trick is to use T duality twice to replace a D5 brain by a D3 brain so that the, the brain is transverse to all of the compact geometry. We say it's probing the compact geometry. And, and the reason for that is, so here, here's the T2, um, which at, at a generic point in moduli space is resolved. Uh, sorry, so after we do T duality twice, the T2 becomes T2 mod Z2 because of the way uh, T duality works with orientifolds. Um, remember type one has uh, O9 plane. So now there's an O7 plane uh, after we use T duality twice. Um, so, uh, so, so we have uh, uh, type 2B orientifold on T2 mod Z2. And we have now a D3 brain transverse to the T2 mod Z2. So this means that the moduli space of the D3 brain will be T2 mod Z2 because uh, you know, just the D3 brain has scalars in it in its world volume, which tell you where on the in the transverse geometry you are, and, and those uh, parameterize the moduli space of the D3 brain. Um, so, so string theory has geometrized the moduli space. Uh, string string dualities have geometrized the moduli space of the D brain. Uh, and and um, at a generic point in the uh, parameter space of the D3 brain, or the moduli space of the the parent string theory, um, the, the T2 mod Z2 will be resolved by quantum effects. Um, so this T2 mod Z2 will just look like a P1, uh, a sphere. And uh, the, the non-perturbative description of this compactification is via what's called F theory on K3. Um, so you, you, uh, you have uh, a, non a spatially varying axiodiloton um, who, who's, uh, w which is naturally thought of as a complex structure of a torus. And uh, the, the complex structure of the torus varies spatially over the CP1 in such a way that the total space of this vibration uh, lo looks like a K3 surface. Um, so, so you have really only the P1 is part of space time, but, but you have this auxiliary geometric structure which, which um, defines the string compactification. And uh, an essential aspect of this, this elliptic vibration is that there are generically 24 singular fibers where the, the torus um, that is generically smooth uh, looks singular. It, it pinches off in some way. A and uh, physically, those singular fibers look like seven brains. And, and a D3 brain near one of those seven brains gets some extra light uh, matter coming from strings stretching between the D3 brain and the D7 brain. So, so you, you, you naturally can think of a D3 brain as probing these seven brains. Um, and uh, the, the seven brains are very heavy. So from, from the D3, so in, in the little string theory limit, they're not dynamical, but they provide uh, global symmetries, for example, uh, for the D3 brain. Um, 
Uh, yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll be interested in very um, special limits in this parameter space where the seven brains clump up into stacks. And so the, the global symmetry will be enhanced. Um, so Max, why you are <coughs> saying that this is a strong weak duality? Uh, yeah, because the uh, a weakly coupled heterotic string theory gets mapped to a strongly coupled type one theory. Oh. Um, okay, so now we can repeat the same steps for uh, studying the theory compactified on a three torus rather than a two torus. So we use, uh, again, strong weak duality to get to a D5 brain. Um, now it's wrapping T3. And then we use T duality three times to replace the D5 brain by a D2 brain. Uh, and so naively, you would say that the moduli space is T3 mod Z2. Uh, but, but there's an extra um, circle, uh, an, an extra dimension, which is provided by the M theory circle. And, and so uh, it's actually T4 mod Z2. Um, and again, at generic points in the perimeter space, it, that T4 mod Z2 orbifold is resolved to a smooth K3 surface. Um, so by com composing all of the dualities I just described, uh, you, we, we just derived a uh, heterotic M3 duality. So a heterotic string theory on T3 is dual to M3 on K3. Um, and a small instanton five brain wrapping T3 is dual to an M2 brain probing K3. And so um, you see that the moduli space of this heterotic five brain is a K3 surface. Um, and specifically, the Coulomb branch of the heterotic five brain is, uh, is the K3 surface. Um, and uh, so, so what are the um, parameters of the little string theory? Well, they're just the moduli of the parent heterotic string theory. Um, the, these scalar fields in the heterotic string theory are not dynamical because of the, the uh, decoupling limit that we took. So, so they're just fixed constants. Um, they're parameters of the little string theory. Uh, and, and so because via this duality, it's clear that the um, moduli space of heterotic string theory on T3 is the exact same as just the data of a Ricci flat metric on K3. Uh, the parameter space of, of the heterotic string theory on T3 is simply equal to the um, moduli space of uh, Ricci flat metrics on K3. Uh, so with the caveat, let, let's say moduli space of unit volume uh, Ricci flat metrics on K3 because the, G, the, um, the string coupling is not a parameter of the little string three because we took that to zero. And similarly, uh, the gauge symmetry in space-time descends to global symmetry of the little string theory. Um, because the gauge fields, just like the scalars of the parent string theory are not dynamical, the gauge fields of the parent string theory are also not dynamical. Okay, so our strategy is now going to be to study compactification of the four-dimensional theory. I so we're going to... Oh, um, excuse me. Uh, oh, please yeah. ask. Please ask. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, please ask. Okay. Um, um, I'm just want to make sure that here the hydraulic string is it doesn't matter is our um, SO thirty two or, or eight times eight right? That's right because after you compactify on a single circle they're t dual so they're the same theory. Okay, thanks. Okay, so our strategy now is going to be to study compactification of the four dimensional theory on a further circle, uh, and this further circle will be taken to have radius capital R. And R will be much larger than all of the other link scales in the problem. So uh, this circle will be much bigger than these two. Um, so the R goes to infinity limit uh, is this limit of this picture that we just described. Uh, um, and in particular, the metric on this K3 surface is singular at these 24 points. So, th th you do, so, so we have a very nice explicit um, metric, which is uh, provided in this reference, um, uh, but but it, it's not a smooth K3 metric because of those 24 singular fibers where, where the curvature diverges. 
So now we're going to study corrections to that singular metric um, away from infinite r. And the corrections away from this limit are determined by instantons in the um, little string theory, compactified on, on this T3. And these instantons are obtained by, by taking the world lines of a 40 BPS particle and wrapping them around this circle. Um, and and uh, uh, so the action of such an instanton is given by the mass of the BPS particle um, times the, the radius. And so uh, the effects of these instantons are then um, are, are exponentially small away from the singular fibers because this mass is non-zero. At the singular fibers, you get some light BPS states, and so uh, the, this exponential suppression um, dies off, and you get very large corrections to the metric near the singular fibers, which is good because, as I said, the metric was singular there. So uh, at large R, oh, whoops, away from the singular fibers, the metric will not be corrected significantly, but uh, near the singular fibers, you'll get some interesting changes. Um, okay, so th this is a very nice heuristic picture, uh, but, but it's uh, very difficult to make progress. Um, actually, first of all, even getting the counts of the numbers of these instantons is hard, uh, but then determining the uh, the um, metric uh, from this picture is also tricky because uh, there, there's no non-renormalization theorem governing uh, perturbative corrections uh, about these instanton backgrounds. And so uh, uh, it, it's a, a much harder problem than, for example, uh, yeah, we're, we're familiar with, uh, with problems that we can solve non-perturbatively despite um, strong coupling where we can use global consistency conditions, for example, from holomorphy, where all you need to do is cons constrain roughly the asymptotics of some function uh, pl plus um, uh, noting that it's holomorphic and that just determines the whole function. Uh, so we would like to be able to do something similar here in order to uh, determine the metric. A and uh, for that purpose, we, we, can, uh, we can exploit a a formalism developed by Gaido Moranitsky in the context of four-dimensional n equals two field theories. Uh, we, we, we observed that this holds equally validly in the context of little string theory. So there, there are indeed holomorphic observables, uh, which, which we call X gamma, um, which, which physically are just the uh, expectation value of wilson took lines wrapping that large circle. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, th those are functions on your moduli space because they're, they're correlation functions. Um, and they also depend on this parameter zeta, uh, which is part of the data defining exactly which uh, line operator you're talking about because uh, uh, you, you can choose uh, different line operators which preserve different supercharges. Um, and uh, the, the first observation of Gaida Moranitsky is that these um, observables are holomorphic by supersymmetry, except uh, they're, they're only piecewise holomorphic. They jump discontinuously uh, at certain points. And their, their, um, their discontinuities are, uh, are determined by a wall crossing formula. So we know exactly how they jump in terms of certain integer invariants, um, which I'll say more about in a second. And, and so, uh, but, but that's, that's just as good as having a holomorphic function for the purposes of being able to write down what this function is. So, uh, so uh, we, we know that these functions are holomorphic um, and we know their asymptotic behavior and we know their discontinuities and that completely c determines the functions. Um, and we can write down, uh, the, the way it does that is you can write down this integral equation um, which, which these functions satisfy, um, which, which forces them to jump uh, in, in these certain ways, uh, and, and that you can show that there exists a unique solution to this integral equation um, uh, at, at large r, which, which, uh, which is the function of interest. And, and that's not just a uh, you know, uh, uh, existence theorem, it's very concrete. What you can do is you take the um, r goes to infinity limit of these functions, which we know that's just some known function, uh, the semi-flat function. 
And you can plug that into the integral equation on the right side. And that gives you a first approximation um, x, x1. Then you can plug x1 in on the right-hand side. And that gives you a second approximation, x2. And that very rapidly converges to, and to the function. Iterative equations. Iterative, some kind of iteration. Yeah, exactly. You're just iterating this integral equation repeatedly. Yeah. And uh, Max, what this uh, capital omega represents? This yeah, thing? good. I just yeah. forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So physically, uh, the, these are the um, BPS state counts, uh, specifically an index of the heterotic little string theory on T2. Okay. So because, which is very sensible from the point of view of this picture that the, the B, counts of BPS states give you, uh, th those determine the counts of these instantons that are contributing. Um, so, so it makes sense that the uh, counts of BPS states in the four dimensional theory um, would determine the, the corrections to the metric. Okay. Okay, so uh, then we form these functions y gamma, which are log of x. Uh, by the way, gamma is just the, the um, it is a, a point in the charge lattice of the theory. Uh, so, so this just labels your, your uh, Wilson Tooth operator, the, the um, charge of the heavy particle that defines that operator. And uh, in terms of these coordinates, we can then construct this canonical two form on the moduli space, and the, uh, which, which is a function of zeta. And this two form satisfies a few amazing properties. Um, one is that despite the fact that it's constructed out of these jumping discontinuous functions, this two form is actually smooth. Uh, furthermore, these functions are in general an infinite Laurent series in, uh, uh, this zeta coordinate, uh, but nevertheless, um, the 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 Laurent series is very finite in just these three terms. Um, and uh, lastly, th just just like these functions were holomorphic, this is a holomorphic two-form in complex structure zeta. So uh, K three by virtue of uh, hyperkähler geometry uh, has a whole CP one worth of complex structures. Um, and, and the complex structure, uh, so, so in complex structure zeta, this is a holomorphic two form. Um, and M and E here label the magnetic and electric charges of the heterotic little string theory. Um, okay, so uh, if we write omega plus at uh, N minus in terms of these uh, uh, real two forms, omega I and omega J, there should be an I here. This would be omega i plus or minus i omega j. Uh, then, uh, so we have omega i, omega j, omega k. Those provide a triplet of Kähler forms um, in, in the, in the uh, for k3. And, and then just uh, via the um, magic of hyperkähler geometry, uh, once you know those three Kähler forms, then you just do matrix multiplication and you get the metric. So, you know, a two form has two indices downstairs. Uh, you can invert a Kähler form to get a, met, a matrix with two indices upstairs and just do matrix multiplication. And that gives you a metric with two indices downstairs. Uh, so, I have so a the, question. Yeah. Um, so if you look at the K3 surface as an elliptic vibration, um, is the elliptic fiber the holomorphic in which complex structure? So the elliptic fibers are holomorphic in the complex structure where the base is also holomorphic. Um, so are, so I, J, you have I, J, K. Is any particular uh, complex structure that is yeah, holomorphic? But the, yeah, but that's convention dependent. Um, you would have to. Yeah. What's your convention? Uh, Does it, it play it, any role? O, o, omega K is the um, canonical complex structure in our conventions. Can I go complex in what? Sorry, I couldn't in, hear. In our conventions. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, so in the semi flat limit, uh, the you have an elliptic vibration in complex structure K. Okay, thanks. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so the, the summary of this slide is that sort of going backwards, the um, magic of hyperkähler geometry gives you this structure. Uh, and uh, uh, 
the magic of physics gives you um, the, the tells you that we can actually write down these functions very explicitly. Um, in in turn, and so the the only thing that we need now is in order to write make this metric fully explicit is these counts of um, these integers omega, um, which are functions of your charge lattice. I should comment a bit on this uh, this extra dependence. Um, a here is a coordinate on the four-dimensional Coulomb branch, so the CP1 base of K3. Um, and, and the dependence on A is uh, sort of weak um, because these, these integers, because it's an index, uh, it, they're generally constant, but they can um, jump discontinuously at certain walls of marginal stability. And, and so, uh, so we, you, you really have a bunch of piecewise discontinuous um, lists of integers uh, as a function of A. Um, so so the, the name of the game is to de determine these, these integers and that, that determines uh, K3 surface, K, K3 metrics. Um, one nice fact uh, is that if you determine these integers at any point in the um, Coulomb branch, then via the wall crossing formula, uh, that, that determines the, these BPS state counts everywhere, in principle at least. Um, okay, so uh, at large R, these X gammas take a universal form, the, um, the semi-flat form, uh, and then there are exponentially suppressed corrections that result from 40 BPS states running around the circle. Um, and so now we just need the BPS index, and I said, oh, sorry. And, and there's a very good approximation uh, at large R that you get just from iterating the integral equation once, um, which is, I'll call this uh, omega inst um, uh, sub gamma. So you sum this over all gammas uh, multiplied by omega of gamma. And, and that, that gives you the first correction to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to that holomorphic two form. Um, and uh, th th this was derived originally um, in the 90s. Uh, it just, just um, uh, y you can study, determine these results just by looking at uh, U1 gauge theory with a single hypermultiplet. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so that's all that's captured in, in this equation is, is the one instanton approximation. Um, It'll be nice to have in mind a geometric picture of what BPS states look like. Uh, so, so if you recall the F theory picture where we have a D3 brain probing uh, the P1 base of a K3 surface. So this is the D3 brain. And these are some seven brains. Uh, that, uh, and BPS states in this picture correspond to web, these string webs um, where uh, they, uh, you know, they look like G depth. So this problem is particularly nice to study at points in the um, in the moduli space of the big string theory or parameter space of the little string theory with a uh, constant tau. So tau, remember, is the complex structure, it, it, the, the coupling constant of the type 2b string theory, which is varying over the CP1. Um, and the reason for that is that the base in in th that case is flat. So so we just have a combinatorial flat surface problem. You know you have uh, uh, T two mod Z two for for example, uh, and, and you just have these string webs winding around and branching on T two mod Z two. And it's still a very hard combinatorial flat surface problem, but but it's uh, it's still a particularly nice limit of this problem. So so we'll fo focus on this limit where T four uh, the, um, whoops, that should be K3. Uh, K, the uh, T4 that we're orbifolding by Z2 uh, factors as T2 fiber times T2 base. Um, and, and so uh, a nice, from the F3 point of view, you should think of this as a T2F vibration over this T2 mod Z2. Uh, and there are four fixed points in the Z2 fixed points in this T2B. Um, uh, and uh, locally near those fixed points, the physics looks like SU2 and F equals four. Um, so by that, I mean the four dimensional SU2 and F equals four conformal field theory. Um, so, and what I mean locally is, you know, if you 
sit in moduli space of the little string theory near one of these fixed points and then take the low energy limit, then you'll reduce that four dimensional super conformal field theory. Uh, and this uh, little string theory has a spin eight to the four global symmetry, which just, you know, you get four copies of the global symmetry of this, uh, these field theories. Um, and I told you before that the global symmetry uh, comes from the st stacks of seven brains. So that shouldn't be surprising because you have uh, four seven brain stacks, um, each of which contributes a spin eight global symmetry. Uh, so any con questions about uh, that before I move on to a new, new subject? Sorry, could you remind me uh, the meaning of radius r in terms of K3 surface? Yeah, uh, geometrically, r determines the ratio of the um, area of the fibers to the area of the base. So oh, okay. uh, large uh -huh. r is the F theory limit where the fibers squish down to zero size. Uh huh. I see. So, but w once you take the uh, the the I mean, dual side, like a, a heterogon T three, it's a, some radius on circle, right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, so so now we we want uh, a way to extract these integers, in, um, these BPS state counts, in order to make this prescription completely explicit. And to do that, we're going to move on to a, a dual uh, description of the K3 metric, um, uh, where K3 arises as a Higgs branch rather than a Coulomb branch. And, and uh, this, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, much nicer because there are no quantum corrections to this problem. So we can just study classical, uh, the, the classical moduli space of, of this physical theory. Uh, so the theory we have in mind is a D2 brain probing a perturbative T2, T4 mod Z2 orbifold. Um, and uh, so this is a, because this is a perturbative type 2A string vacuum, uh, there's no non-abelian gauge symmetry, uh, which means that um, this is not just the S1 reduction of the earlier M theory frame on K3. So remember, uh, via string dualities, I can even, if I move this zoom thing out of the way, I can go back here. So. Uh, we had this duality frame where the heterotics little string theory compactified on T3 was dual to an M2 brain um, on K3, uh, probing K3. Uh, so, so this is not just the S1 reduction of that compactification um, be, because uh, that compactification had this spin eight to the four global symmetry um, uh, where, whereas uh, this perturbative string vacuum does not have that global symmetry. Um, and uh, it, the way that this, this symmetry got broken is because uh, there, there's a B field, half a unit of B field um, localized on each of the, the collapsed two cycles of the T4 mod Z2 orbifold. Um, and uh, so, so from this D2 brain point of view, that B field is responsible from, for breaking global symmetries. Uh, but fortunately, uh, th this B field, um, even though it changes the ultraviolet physics, it doesn't change the metric on the moduli space. And that's due to a non-renormalization theorem, which tells you that the string coupling is in a background vector multiplet. And so G string can't affect the Higgs branch uh, metric. Um, and in the limit where G string goes to infinity, so from the type 2A point of view, the M3 circle is decompactifying, uh, the B field dilutes away. Um, because, you know, it's B field in 2A is three form flux in M3 wrapping the circle. Um, so that, that flux dilutes away in that limit. And, and the moduli space is then the same as that of the M2 ring. So even though the ultraviolet physics here is, is different from that of the Coulomb branch picture, the metric on moduli space is the same. And, and the words I just said, you know, uh, where the UV is different on the Higgs and Coulomb sides, but the metric on moduli space is the same, and the global symmetries in the UV are different, um, uh, but, but they enhance to be the same in, the, in, in this limit of G string going to infinity, uh, it sh should be very reminiscent, if you've heard of it, of 3D mirror symmetry. And this is not an accident. Uh, as discussed in this paper, uh, the, the same picture of, um, 
of compactifying from M3 to type 2A string theory yields the simplest mirror pairs uh, studied in the original paper on 3D mirror search. Okay, so uh, so let's we're we're gonna um, build up to this hyperkähler quotient description of the K of a K3 surface. So hyperkähler quotient is just a fancy way of saying um, finding the classical moduli space of, of this D2 brain gauge three. Uh, so um, let me just review the uh, general rules for how a hyperkähler quotient works, and then we'll work through a few examples uh, that build up to a K3 surface because. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, a lot of indices in the K3 case. And so if we can work through a few sim simpler examples first, that will uh, be useful. So in general, uh, the superpotential of this gauge theory um, takes this form, just uh, thanks to 3dn equals 4 uh, supersymmetry, where phi is the chiral multiplet and the n equals 4 vector multiplet. Um, and uh, mu plus is some, uh, function of the hypermultiple fields. Um, and and uh, the F term equation is, is just mu plus equals zero. And the D terms analogously take the form mu r equals zero, uh, where mu r is a Hermitian function of the hypermultiples. This, this one is not necessarily Hermitian. Um, so I'll call this the, the complex moment map and this the real moment map for that reason. And uh, the so, so these two being zero defines the um, vanishing of, of the potential. Um, and, and the Higgs branch is then the quotient of the, of the space of zeros of the potential by the gauge group. So, so uh, this, this procedure it defines the hyperkähler quotient. You just study the, the, the submanifold of the um, space parameterized by your hypermultiplet scalars where these moment maps vanish, and then you quotient by the gauge group. So, so any questions about um, about that? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 um, so he, this Higgs branch is um, is uh, you mean is the sixty and you and you call one comma one theory? Uh, so the heterotic little string theory has one comma zero supersymmetry. Um, and uh, so, so this construction was built was over here. This Coulomb branch construction was based on on that um, that the Coulomb branch of that n equals one comma zero little string theory. But here we're we're studying a different three dimensional gauge theory. So so this is three D n equals four supersymmetry. Oh, it's on the D D two brains. Exactly. Okay. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. Thanks. Okay, cool. So yeah, so we're studying a three-dimensional gauge theory, although the precise dimension doesn't really matter. These could be D0 brains at this point, and the hyperkiller quotient would work the same. Um, but but for, for, uh, for concreteness, it's very useful to think of these as D2 brains. Okay, so let, let's warm up with the simplest example, which is uh, 3D n equals 8 gauge theory. Um, uh, so from the n equals four point of view, this is just a, uh, adjoint hypermultiplet plus the, um, the vector multiplet and, uh, the adjoint hypermultiplet will, will think of it as consisting of these chiral multiplets U and V, uh, and the, um, super potential, this, this is familiar, uh, max super potential and maximally supersymmetric gauge theories. Um, and the D terms are, take this one. Um, so this is just the Higgs branch of n parallel D2 brains. So obviously the, um, you know, dividing between Higgs and Coulomb branch in this case is sort of arbitrary because, uh, uh, they're, they're, um, they're, yeah, the, the moduli space doesn't just factorize in this case. Um, so what I really mean is just the, the sub subspace of the moduli space where the cool, the, the, um, vector multiplet scalars vanish. Uh, okay, so um, let's now see how to get the moduli space from this picture. Uh, so we first set this to zero, which uh, implies that U and V can be simultaneously unitarily upper triangulized uh, via what's called the sure decomposition. Um, and uh, 
then mu r equals zero implies that those upper triangular matrices are actually diagonal. Uh, and you can, so, so then you can fix most of the gauge group by, by using that, that, um, that unitary diagonalization to diagonalize your matrices. Uh, and the remaining part of the gauge group is the vial group of U of n, which uh, conjugates diagonal matrices to diagonal matrices. And, and so you have to additionally quotient by, S, by Sn. Uh, and that just permutes the, the various eigenvalues of your matrices. So, so you indeed get uh, you know, uh, sum n of C2, where C2 is because you have both U and B. So you have two, uh, you know, each eigenvalue, you think of the, the, the them as U and V eigenvalues as paired up because they swap together under the SN action. So here, is there some middle symmetry that can exchange the Higgs branch here and the, the uh, cooler branch in, in before? Uh, like 3D middle symmetry? Yeah, 3, 3D N equals eight gauge theories are, are um, are too constrained for 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 that to, um, that that to happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now so now let's move on to a slightly more difficult example, but only slightly. So we'll now study uh, D two brain probing this orbifold. Um, so, so the prescription provided by Douglas and Moore is that you uh, start on the covering space, the C2 covering space, with the D2 brain and its image brain. Uh, so, so the starting point is a U of two gauge theory, the, the, you know, the, the N equals two case from this slide. Um, we just have two parallel D2 brains probing C2. Uh, and then we impose some orbifold projections on the, on the fields in the world volume. So, so the starting point is the n equals two theory from the last slide, and then we require uh, 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 our u and v to take to take the, this form. So the minus sign is is uh, easy to understand. That's just because uh, the u and v fields get negated by the z two orbifold action. Uh, the sigma z's are because um, okay, it, think of this first of all as being sigma x. Uh, then it's just permuting the, um, the adjoint indices associated to the two D2 brains. So, so again, that, that's very sensible that there should be a sigma x here. Uh, it, it, you, via a change of basis, you can swap sigma x with sigma z, and that proves computationally more useful. So, uh, so we, we put sigma z's here. But you, if you wanted, you could do this with sigma x. Uh, here, g is an arbitrary element of the gauge group. So, uh, uh, Ga ga the gauge group is the subs subgroup of U of two, uh, which satisfies this condition. Um, and there's no minus sign here because you know the gauge fields don't get negated by the, um, the Z two action. Okay, so the general solution of these constraints take the takes these forms. So U is uh, just some off diagonal matrix, so is V, and G is a diagonal matrix. Uh, okay, and and notice that e, e, this e to the i theta act, acts tri trivially on u and v because g acts by conjugation, and so really we just have a u one gauge theory. Um, so setting mu plus equals to zero, uh, you can just com compute the commutator of u and v, and you learn that uh, these two column vectors have to be proportional to each other. Uh, then setting mu r equals zero tells you furthermore that the absolute value of this constant of proportionality is one. Uh, and then you can use this U1 freedom uh, from alpha uh, to set lambda equals one. So then the last remaining gauge freedom is, uh, is given by setting alpha equals pi. So uh, this is I and this is minus I. And the reason for that is uh, that preserves the, the, the gauge choice lambda equals one. Um, so, so, so you need to further quotient by that. Uh, and, and it's easy to see why this uh, alpha equals pi um, preserves this condition, because uh, if lambda equals one, that says u plus equals u minus, so I'll just call that u. And v plus equals v minus, so I'll just call that v. Uh, and what this alpha equals pi transformation does uh, 
is it negates both u and v. So if I, you know, if I negate both u plus and u minus, then I preserve the fact that u plus equals u minus. Okay, so uh, that means that my moduli space is just um, parameterized by u and v, uh, which parameterize c2, except there's the z2 quotient. So I get c2 mod z2 as promised. Okay, so now uh, let's upgrade from this non these non-compact examples to a compact one. Uh, so this is built based on a uh, paper by Wadi Taylor. Uh, we So as I said at the very beginning, it's useful to think of T4 as uh, R4 mod a lattice, um, where lambda is some four-dimensional lattice embedded in R4. Uh, so um, the starting point is now a 3D n equals eight u of k infinity to the four gauge theory. So, uh, so k is the number of, uh, of D2 brains probing T4. And then we have infinity to the four image um, brains, one, one for each translate um, under this lambda action. Uh, so, you know, just like here, we had uh, a start, our starting point was a u of two theory because we had a D2 brain and its Z2 image brain. Here we just have the whole z to the four image set set of image brains. Um, so so in one fundamental domain of this lambda action, we'll just have k d two brains. But then we have uh, infinity to the four fundamental domains. Um, so so we get this funny gauge theory with an infinite dimensional gauge group. Um, and as usual, chirals uh, in some three D n equals eight gauge theory are just uh, matrices. Uh, uh, so, so I'll, I'll write the indices for this k infinity to the four. Um, I'll, I'll split it as in this form where uh, i and j run from one to k and m and n are uh, points in this lattice. They're, they're lattice vectors. Uh, and, and we'll leave the i and j indices implicit. So u, m, n denotes a k by k matrix. And then the orbifold projections that we impose on these fields uh, so, you know, we have a Z to the four gauge group, or sorry, orbifold group. So, so we need to impose um, Z to the four projections. Uh, and what we do is we say for any lattice vector L, um, if we translate the two indices of U, um, that, that needs to give the same untranslated uh, matrix plus uh, just a, a, a overall translation of the, um, of the field uh, U. Um, so I here is just the k by k identity matrix. This is the z to the four by z to the four uh, identity matrix. Uh, and and so, so this is just uh, a constant times the identity matrix. Um, and same for v. Uh, and and uh, what I mean by LU and LV is given by this. So uh, you know if you think of a lattice vector L as being embedded in R4, then it has four coordinates, L1, L2, L3, L4 and LU and LV are just these complex um, combinations of those coordinates. So these projections imply that only uh, these two combina th these two coefficient functions, uh, UN and VN are independent. Um, but but you can see that because this, these projections imply that UMN just depends on the difference uh, at N minus M, um, you know, just set L here equal to minus M, for example. Um, and so uh, UM MN equals U N minus M if M and N are different. And if they're the same, then you just get this extra piece uh, proportional to the K by K identity matrix coming from this term. Uh, so, okay, so this means that the general solution of these orbifold um, projections takes this form where uh, uh, these UNs are the same UNs from the last slide. EN is uh, in words, um, I mean, in equations, it's this, but uh, in words, it's just the uh, matrix with which is the identity on the nth diagonal. So, uh, you know, sh sh uh, where the, where the um, column index and the row index differ by N, uh, uh, it, it's just one there. Um, so that makes sense because you know uh, when when the column and row indices differ by by some amount, then uh, all of those those entries in the matrix are equal to each other. 
So that's what's going on here. And then this is just a, a constant matrix um, which, which just encodes those translations uh, uh, on, on the diagonal. Um, so the, the, uh, the commutation relations of these infinite dimensional matrices E of n and W are very useful. Uh, so E of n commutes with W to be a multiple of E of n and same with WB. Okay, so that was a lot of notation. So please, uh, do, are there any questions about these two slides? Okay, great. Uh, so similarly, um, gauge transformations uh, take uh, the, the solution of the, um, the Z to the four projection for the gauge field, sorry, for, ga for the gauge group takes this form. Um, and so uh, as usual, uh, gauge transformations act via conjugation um, on, on U and V, uh, which here just takes this form. Um, so I'm just plugging in the, uh, the, the form of U. Uh, and so, um, so, you know, U equals W plus this sum uh, transforms to this stuff. So uh, dropping the, the W part from both the left side and the right side, we can just say that this sum transforms like this. And this is all very suggestive um, uh, of these identifications. So what I mean by that is uh, that, the, um, it, okay, well, first let me define these things and then I can explain what I mean by these identifications. Uh, so uh, consider uh, a, a coordinate Y valued in the dual torus. So the, the dual torus is, uh, is the quotient of R4 by the dual lattice, where the dual lattice is just the set of lattice vectors in R4, which whose dot product with any um, vector in our original lattice is an integer multiple of two pi. So, uh, so the reason that Y is valued in the, this dual torus, the quotient of R4 by that dual lattice is because if I shift Y by a dual lattice vector, then this dot product just shifts by two pi times an integer. And so uh, this exponential is constant. And the reason for these identifications is that the algebra satisfied by these, uh, th these th this function e to the i n y and this derivative um, is the exact same as that given by the commutation relations here. So you know if, if you compute the commutator of an exponential with a derivative, just using the product rule, you you get this. Um, and another reason for these identifications is because uh, U and B, U and V are behaving like covariant derivatives with respect to holomorphic coordinates. So you know if if I write B uh, U is is the um, is the the this half of the of U the sum the infinite sum part, um, then U just looks like uh, the, this B U plus a derivative. Uh, which is indeed a, a U of K covariant derivative on, on the dual torus. Uh, and similarly, uh, uh, the way U transforms under a uh, gauge transformation um, just looks like the transformation of a gauge field, of a, of a U K gauge field uh, under a U of K gauge transformation. So, uh, you know, uh, gauge fields are not really valued in the adjoint representation because of this this extra term, which involves the derivative of the gauge transformation. And that's exactly uh, picked up by, by this rule for how U, U transforms. Um, and, and this is this uh, picture of uh, fields living on the dual torus is not, not an accident. It's a manifestation of t-duality uh, because kd2 brains uh, transverse to t4 map to kd6 brains wrapping t4. And U and B indeed become uh, uh, the, 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 these covariant derivatives. Um, and so uh, this makes it clear that the gauge group is the um, group of maps from T4 to U of K, just like in a normal gauge theory. Uh, and so we call this in, in analogy with the normal loop group, which is maps from S1 to U of K. We call this the for loop group or the floop group. Uh, and we denote that by uh, this hat U of K. 
So uh, what we've just learned, let's just take stock of what we've just learned. Uh, SIMK of T4 is the hypercalar quotient of, uh, okay, why is the, so first of all, the Fluv algebra is just, you know, the maps from T4 to the, the U of K Lie algebra. Uh, it's quaternified, meaning, you know, there are four copies of it because uh, they're the real and imaginary parts of both U and V. Um, so uh, it's the hypercalar quotient of the quaternified U of K Fluv algebra by the U of K Fluv group. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, any questions about the last few slides? Okay, cool. So let's see that very concretely following our general prescription for how to, how to extract the moduli space from, from a 3D n equals four gauge theory. Um, so in this D6 brain language, uh, the moduli space has a very nice interpretation because remember the moment maps are just defined by commutators of U and V uh, and, and their, their adjoints. Um, and commutators of covariant derivatives are just the field strength. Uh, and, and, and so the um, moment map equations and mu plus equals mu r equals zero are just equivalent if you do just a little bit of algebra to this equation. That tells you that the field strength um, of, of the, the U of K connection uh, it is, uh, is anti-self-dual. So this is the Hodge star. Um, so, so we're just looking at the moduli space of anti-self-dual U of K connections on, uh, on the dual torus mod, mod the U of K gauge group. And uh, uh, it turns out that this, is, this can be given an even simpler characterization because uh, if you note that the um, norm squared of the field strength two form, uh, it, which by definition is this, so this is some non-negative number, by the anti-self-duality condition, it's equal to this. Uh, but this, this uh, four form is exact. Uh, it's just the differential of the turn Simon's three form, and so this is zero. So, so we're actually interested in the moduli space of flat U of K connections, or Wilson lines on the dual torus. Um, and that's indeed sim K T4. And we knew that we had to get the moduli space of Wilson lines on the dual torus, because that, that, that is the moduli space of the D6 brain gauge theory. Um, Okay, so how do we, uh, so, so it's, first of all, let me just say it's physically sensible that we reduce to constant gauge fields. Um, so, uh, but because uh, the, from the D6 brain point of view, the non-zero modes have clues of Klein masses. Um, and the moduli space is compact because of large gauge transformation. So for example, uh, for K equals one, so we just have a U1 gauge theory in the D6 brain picture. Um, uh, uh, you know, if I conjugate um, my gauge field by, uh, uh, X, by a gauge transformation, which is just proportional to e to the i n theta, uh, then this, this uh, uh, you know, moving the exponential past this derivative um, just gives me a translation. So that, that compactifies the space parameterized by u and by the u zero and v zero zero modes. Okay, so uh, any questions about how we obtain that moduli space in KT4 before I move on to K3? Okay, so K3 just involves one extra step, which is uh, taking the theory that we just described and imposing a Z2 orbifold. So we're gonna orbifold R4 by lambda and then by Z2, um, or equivalently by this quadruply infinite dihedral group. Uh, and and th this gauge theory was studied in these papers. Uh, so we're going to start with a uh, uh, hat U of two gauge theory, um, two because you know we have the G brain and the image brain as usual for the under the Z two action, uh, and then we're going to impose Z two projections. So uh, it, it shouldn't be shocking that the um, g given our experience with the C two mod Z two case that the Z two projections take this form. And the novelty compared to the SIMK T4 case is that we have FI parameters. Uh, that, that, um, so we, we couldn't add these in before doing the Z2 projection, but once doing, well, after we do the Z2 projection, these FI parameters become gauge invariant. Uh, at, uh, because our, you know, our gauge group is not the full U of two hat gauge group, it's some subgroup. Um, so if we just plug in what U and V are, uh, then we, we 
uh, find that these are the moment maps. There, there's some infinite sum um, over E of n times, uh, times this uh, k by k matrix. Um, well, sorry, k here is just two. So some two by two matrix. Um, and Cn plus is just a coefficient multiplying sigma z. So this is just some constant uh, that we get to pick. Uh, now, this looks like we have z to the four many fi parameters, c plus, and z to the four real fi parameters, cr. Uh, but gauge invariance uh, uh, is, is only holds if um, we, we have lots of relations between these c's. So, that, so they're not all in a, independent. And in fact, we only get uh, 16 uh, 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 complex fi parameters and 16 real fi parameters. Um, so th uh, the way that works is they only depend on the equivalence class of n in this uh, quotient lattice. Um, so, uh, so there are 16 triplets of fi parameters. Um, and if you do the counting, you know, we have 16 triplets plus we have the 10 original moduli of, uh, of the um, of the choice of our metric on T4. Uh, 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 and you can see that as 10 because you know you have the you have a four by four symmetric real matrix. Uh, so that's 10. Um, so that gives you 58 parameters, which is exactly the dimension of the moduli space of, of the um, of Ricci flat metrics on K3. So so uh, the, these parameters do do uh, do fill up all of the dimensions. And uh, the way to see that that um, that this constraint is the right one to impose, uh, well, okay, An, the easiest way to see this is in the D6 brain picture. So uh, the FI parameters just multiply this infinite sum, um, where uh, you know this 2m is because uh, we shift, you know, all the coefficient here is the same for all of these vectors by this condition. Uh, so the way to see that is we just pull the e to the i n theta out i n y out of the sum, uh, and, and then this becomes a, a sum over the um, sixteen z two fixed points on the dual torus. So y prime are the sixteen z two fixed points on the dual torus um, of these delta functions, uh, and uh, a gauge transformation by the orbifold projection is required to commute with sigma z at those sixteen fixed points. Um, so because of the, the delta function, th these terms only care about the value of a gauge transformation at y prime. And so uh, g there will commute with sigma z. And so this will be gauge invariant. Uh, okay, so uh, from this point of view, it, it, it's now hopefully believable that our moment map equations get deformed to this form, uh, where eta y prime is just a, a self dual two form with constant coefficients. So uh, you get three. Uh, real degrees of freedom um, for each y prime. Uh, um, so, so the solutions of this are certain singular u of two connections um, on t on the dual torus. And uh, just like before, we've gotten sort of good at this. So uh, I'll, I'll maybe go through this a little quickly. But we can see that the moduli space of this gauge theory with vanishing fi parameters is t four mod z two. So we can restrict to the zero modes thanks to Kluza Klein masses and gauge transformations. Um, so u and v are now just the u zero and v zero. Um, and the remaining moment maps are the same as for the, the C2 mod Z2 orbifold. And the same gauge symmetry there is also present here. Uh, and that gauge symmetry preserves this, this condition. Um, so we can assume that. Uh, uh, so, so we can use the gate, use up the gauge freedom in the exact same way we did in the C two mod Z two case to um, to get coordinates valued in C two mod Z two, and then just like uh, in the T uh, four case, we we have the, these uh, extra spatially varying gauge transformations um, which, which pres preserve all this gauge choice and they implement uh, uh, this shift. So the, the, these guys compactify the moduli space, um, and we indeed have T4 mod T2. OK, so we have now uh, formulated the um, 3D n equals 4 gauge theory that's going to um, be used to obtain K3 metrics. And we've seen that it gives T4 mod T2 when the FI parameters vanish. Uh, 
any, any questions about that before I start turning on the FI parameters? Okay, great. So uh, we're, we're just gonna turn on the FI parameters in perturbation theory. Um, and the fantastic fact uh, is that, you know, this nonlinear differential equation characterizing F um, linearizes about the, the um, trivial solution I just described that gives you T4 mod D2. Uh, and so uh, at first order in perturbation theory, um, you, you, you know, each of these uh, moment map equations decouples from all of the others. And so you originally had an infinite dimensional nonlinear algebra problem, nonlinear, so it's, it's nonlinear because of these commutator terms. And it's also infinite dimensional because these terms couple all of the different um, uh, U's and V's together. So that looks like it's gonna be a disaster. Uh, but, but at first order in these FI parameters, uh, all of the ends decouple from each other and, and you just get a linear algebra problem. So uh, schematically, uh, all, of, all of these equations just look like uh, some constant vector CN uh, equals some uh, matrix LN, which is a function of Q. Q here is, uh, it is the U and V, um, which, which are our coordinates on our moduli space. So those are the zero modes uh, of U and V. Um, multiplying this vector Q, capital Q, which is the um, nth Fourier modes uh, of uh, U and V. So we, we just have some matrix equation for each N that character, characterizes the um, the uh, functional dependence of the higher Fourier modes on the zero modes. Uh, so, so very more abstractly, what we're defining is an embedding of K3 into this infinite dimensional flat space, um, uh, which is just parameterized by all of the Fourier modes. Um, and, and the general solution of this linear equation takes this form. Uh, so, so the reason that you can't just invert L is because L has a null space. And uh, physically, it's very sensible that L has a null space because uh, that's exactly the um, infinitesimal gauge transformations. Uh, so uh, you know, th those will be annihilated. And yeah, if I make any infinitesimal gauge transformations here, those, of course, will give, also give solutions. Um, and, and the null space of L exactly uh, corresponds with that. Uh, that space of gauge, gauge freedom. Uh, so fine, so the most general solution takes this form where this is just any uh, gauge trans transformation. Uh, uh, w w and so gauge transformations just look like this. So we can just choose the gauge where this vanishes uh, and I'll call this the least norm solution because uh, mathematically this solution has the smallest norm out of all possible solutions. Um, so, so we've now defined an embedding of K3 into this infinite dimensional flat space. So very explicitly, uh, uh, you know, UNY is the coefficient of UN multiplying sigma Y poly matrix. Uh, UNZ multiplies the sigma Z poly matrix and same for B. Um, so uh, yeah, that, this defines, th determines the functional dependence of all of the higher Fourier modes on the zero modes. Um, and here these capital N's and D's are defined from here. Okay, and then uh, you, you just take the Kähler forms on that infinite dimensional space, uh, you, um, and you just uh, uh, pull them back from, from the infinite dimensional space to K3 uh, so concretely, you know, we have these functions um, that define the four e higher Fourier modes as a function of the zero modes. So you just plug them into this differential um, and same for all the other differentials. And that gives you these two forms, omega i, j, and k on k3. Um, so uh, if we do that for the, at the orbifold level, so before turning on any fi parameters, we get the, the, these results which are just the flat omega plus and omega k uh, on the flat orbifold. And then at first order in the FI parameters, we just get um, this perturbative correction, uh, which I'll write in this form. Um, so you know, the omega n plus is the correction to omega plus 
coming from the nth Fourier mode and seeing for omega k and omega x. Uh, okay, so the exact formulas obviously aren't super exciting. Uh, uh, they're in the paper if you want to see them, but I do want to just stress how simple this is. You know, you can plug it into a computer uh, and and uh, do anything you want with these. Um, okay, so and then we just use the usual prescription for computing the metric uh, from those that that triplet of Kähler forms, and you can sim similarly compute the complex structures from the triplet of Kähler forms if you want. Uh, um, okay, so let me avoid. Uh, I mean, I'm just gonna. You know, I want to show you here. Are the here's the metric. The formulas don't matter at all, which is why I even let it run off the side of the screen. Uh, you can look them up in the paper if you want, but I just want to emphasize that you know this is the whole the whole first order correction to the metric. It's very tractable. Um, okay, and same for the complex structure matrices. Uh, okay, so if you've fallen asleep from the last many slides, that's perfectly sensible, but I ask you to wake up now uh, because uh, this is sort of the exciting payoff. Uh, you compute the Ricci tensor from that metric um, and, and it is indeed zero. And similarly, you know, J squared is minus one and IJ equals K and all the identities of hypercalar geometry are satisfied. Okay, so fine, that was at first order. Uh, and we relied very strongly on being at first order so that we could have all these different Fourier modes decouple from each other. And uh, so, so that um, uh, the linear algebra problem would linearize. So you might think that beyond first order, we're in trouble. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, actually, um, we basically solved the exact same problem at every order. Uh, so the way this works is um, suppose inductively that you know the new minus one order uh, correction, and you want to determine the newth order correction, well then again, uh, this infinite sum just uh, decomposes as uh, some function that, you know, depends on the new minus one order stuff, plus uh, this, this, X, this new term that just involves the zeroth order term multiplying your new corrections. And so uh, the moment maps actually take the exact same form of the, the exact same matrix uh, times your corrections. And the only new part is that your, your effective F vector of FI parameters is, is changed. It's now some new uh, constants w which depend on the, on the new minus one -th order uh, uh, cues that you found. So at every order, all you do is you multiply the exact same matrices uh, together times this, this vector. And, and all that changes at each order is that uh, C nu is some function with, with, of the um, nu minus one -th order fields that you, you already determined. So you can iterate this ad, ad infinitum um, and, and get the full uh, embeddings of K3 into this infinite dimensional space. So that, that you know, it completely explicitly de determines K3 metrics uh, and, you know, via formulas that are rather easy to put on a computer. Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, before I move on, just any questions about, about this hyperkiller quotient? Uh, so I have a question uh, very quickly. So what you did here was a, you discussed a perturbation expansion in the fayette Leopoldos terms uh, parameters of the hyperkiller quotient that you constructed for the K3 surfaces. That's right. All right, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now I want to relate this back to the Coulomb branch picture uh, that, that we discussed before. Um, so, uh, so let's just make some rescalings of our fields so, uh, uh, so, so that the um, omega k takes this form. Uh, so th this uh, concretely uh, uh, an answers the question someone asked earlier about what R was doing geometrically. It's the ratio of the um, of the size of the base to the size of the fibers. Uh, and, and uh, uh, okay, there, there's like a whole bunch of notation here, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, the, the main point is uh, these last two slides, I guess, um, that uh, uh, our, our fiber coordinate is uh, coordinate on a torus of complex structure tau f, our base torus is a complex structure tau b. Uh, and we're doing this Z2 orbifold of, of K3, so our coordinates are identified as so. 
Uh, and because of the rescaling from UNV to ANZ, these identifications in the UNV language mean that our lattice is, uh, is, is parameterized as so. So these n tildes here are integers. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if z shifts to z plus one in v language, that's v shifting to v plus one over two row. And, and so uh, it shifts by an integer over one over two row. Um, so, so the, yeah, the lattice vectors are of, of lambda are parameterized um, by, by these four integers. Okay, so now we're gonna do a two-dimensional Poisson resummation of over the formulas that over the um, of the Kähler forms that we just found uh, um, over n three and n four, uh, and uh, so what is a Poisson resummation? It, it's motivated by this identity. Um, you you just multiply both sides of this identity by some function f of x, and then you integrate x uh, over um, over let's say the real line. So so that on the left side, that just gives you the fu function f of x evaluated at each n, uh, at each yeah, at each point of the lattice. And on the right side, it gives you the Fourier dual, um, when, which we de denote that way. Uh, so so this is a very cool identity in, um, in in for infinite sums. And you can do this. So this was here for one dimension, but you can do it just as well in other dimensions. Um, so, so we're going to do a two-dimensional Poisson resummation. So we do a two-dimensional Fourier transformation of the functions that showed up in the Kähler form. Uh, uh, and uh, this is motivated by the geometric picture we're trying to make, make contact with, where the, the fibers are very small. Um, and we'll set C plus to zero for simplicity. Uh, physically, what this means is we're, um, we're the, um, the, uh, semi-flat geometry, the geometry that you get in the limit where R goes to infinity and you get an elliptic vibration is just the T, T, uh, the, the uh, T2 mod Z2 base, the T2 vibration over that. Uh, and, and all of the corrections to the orbifold limit are coming only when you turn, when you, um, when you uh, have uh, R being finite. Um, so C pluses affect the four-dimensional Coulomb branch geometry whereas CRs just affect the three-dimensional Coulomb branch. Okay, so I will spare you the details of doing the Fourier transform, and uh, I just want to write down the answer and then see if we can extract some physics from this. Uh, so, uh, uh, before, but, okay. Uh, this sum is over relatively prime P and Q, um, as well as the integers n tilde one and n tilde two. Um, uh, these thetas here are functions of our real fi parameters. Uh, so, so uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to say exactly how they're related, but it's, it's you know, thetas squared is related to c squared, roughly. Uh, and uh, as usual, just like the fi parameters, were, there were only 16 independent ones. Here, there are only 16 independent ones, uh, which are um, now associated uh, so, so uh, they're divided into four groups of four. Uh, so the four groups are associated to the four seven brain stacks of our F3 compactification. And then the four FI parameters at each of those stacks are associated to the, um, the Carton uh, U1 to the fourth subgroup of spin four. Uh, so, so you get four uh, real mass parameters for each of those four seven brain stacks. Um, and that, that's what these theta parameters are. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so this this uh, if, if we now compare with this formula for the first approximation coming from the Coulomb branch formula formalism, um, uh, this looks very similar, and we can read off the BPS spectrum of the little string theory from from by comparing those two formulas. So uh, this part def def defines a bunch of hypermultiplets. Um, with uh, with spin eight, um, which, which transform under spin eight representations. So here we see uh, weights of the vector representation of spin eight, um, because you know uh, two cosine of this is just the same as e to the i n theta um, plus 
e to the minus i and theta, uh, and uh, and then there are four four different thetas labeled by j. So that's exactly the um, the weights of the vector representation plus minus one zero 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 plus minus one zero zero. Um, and then similarly here, you have the two spinner representations. Uh, and I didn't say exactly what these SJs are, but they're all just plus or minus ones. Um, you have an even number of S's or an, uh, of pluses or an odd number of pluses, depending on whether P and Q are, are uh, both odd or one of them is even. Um, so uh, that is exactly the BPS spectrum of the SU2 and F equals four uh, 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 gauge theory. Um, you have this half hyperbolt split with gauge charge PQ for all relatively prime P and Q. Uh, in one of those three eight-dimensional representations of spin eight, depending on whether P and Q or both are odd. Uh, and, and then uh, you, in addition, have a vector multi split with gauge charge P, 2P, 2Q um, in the singlet of spin eight. Uh, and the BPS index of a vector multi split is minus two. Um, and if you plug into the general formulas, that data, that indeed gives you this minus eight when n, n is even. So, so uh, we, we see um, for each tilde n1 and tilde n2, we have a copy of the SU2 and F equals four BPS spectrum. Uh, and um, the, the central charge of such a state is given by this formula. And that again has a very nice physical interpretation. This is the tension of this PQ string winding around the F theory base. And this is just the length of, of the, um, you know, if I take absolute values on both sides to get the mass of the BPS state, this is the tension. And uh, this is just the length of that PQ string. Uh, so NB is just telling you your winding number around the F3 base. Uh, and, it, and it's quantized in units of a half because you can wind halfway around and end on a seven brain stack. Um, so you have, yeah, you have integral amounts of half, half winding. Uh, so um, we have four doubly infinite towers of SU2 and F equals four spectra, where the four towers are associated to the four uh, gauge groups, um, the four spin eight, uh, spin eight groups. Uh, so that is a really nice physical interpretation. And at this point, you might celebrate and say that we have gotten the full spectrum of the little string theory. This all worked very nicely, um, but that can't be right. Um, uh, one way to see this is, it, uh, uh, from the wall crossing formula, it, you know, if I have this this very simple string um, here, uh, that's one of the strings that we had in our spectrum. And here's another one of the strings that we had in our spectrum. As we move our D3 brain pat, um, away from these two orbifold points uh, uh, to here, uh, there th we cross a wall of marginal stability um, and we can now form this new string web. Uh, this half of the diagram is just the Z2 image of this half, so you can ignore it. Um, so we just have this simple string web, uh, and, and that wasn't one of the webs that we just described. So, so we must be missing some BPS states. Um, so the, the funny conclusion then is that these states only contribute at the next order, at least in the FI parameters. They don't contribute to the metric at first order in the FI parameters. So there's some funny cancellations going on uh, that, that would be nice to understand. But we expect that we can get these BPS states um, uh, and, and hopefully all of the BPS states just by iterating this procedure at the next order in the FI parameters. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, a hyperclear quotient yields these computationally useful, explicit analytic expressions for K3 metrics. Uh, and they secretly, via Poisson resummation, encode the solution to a little string theory BPS state counting problem. So there are these piecewise constant lists of integers hiding inside of K3 and similarly weights of spin eight representations. Uh, and uh, via string dualities, we can recast this BPS state counting problem uh, in terms of these string webs, um, which, which mathematically you can think of as being related to the, uh, this is the tropical limit of open string reduced chrome off wind theory. Uh, and this aligns geometrically very nicely with the SYZ construction of mirror manifolds. Um, uh, uh, if you know what that is. Uh, so, it, so in addition to all of the above, the geometry of string webs is again uh, an ingredient in the in, in K3 metrics via the you know the central charge that showed up in those metrics. Uh, so, 
by finding the full BPS spectrum, which we have not done yet, we'll complete the specification of this Coulomb branch construction. Uh, and we intend to do so by iterating the Higgs branch procedure once more. Uh, there are a bunch of other approaches to studying the BPS spectrum of the little string theory. Uh, so I mentioned open string gromov wind theory, there's geometric engineering of the little string theory, a bunch of other approaches uh, physicists have developed for studying little string theories. And there are very neat connections with the maximally supersymmetric uh, one one little string theory that we describe in our paper, uh, and, and as well as open topological string theory. Um, so, um, yeah, there's this funny fact that the BPS spectrum of this maximally supersymmetric little string theory also defines uh, K3 metrics. Um, and uh, e even without most of the counts, just the ones that, that one gets for free by knowing the massless BPS states responsible for the singular fibers, the Coulomb branch construction already gives some very accurate approximations, just the, the one instanton approximation we wrote down before. Uh, which are similar to uh, the Gross-Wilson approximation um, where, uh, yeah. Uh, and lastly, let me just mention a number of generalizations we're excited about. Uh, so first of all, there are other orbifold limits of K3. Uh, and, uh, and some of these uh, have elliptic vibration limits. Uh, and by studying tho tho those uh, limits in the same way that we just did with via this Poisson resummation, um, th that should yield the BPS spectra of the Minahan Nemeshansky STFTs. Uh, uh, and, um, okay, I mentioned this already. Uh, adding D6 brains in the hyperkähler quotient picture, where we have, so we have D2 brains. If we, in addition, have D6 brains wrapping T4, uh, that'll allow us to obtain uh, uh, ne nearly all and hopefully all. Uh, known compact hyperkiller manifold. So we're hoping that we can give uh, hyperkiller quotient constructions of all known compact hyperkiller manifolds. Uh, and 3D mirror symmetry again relates these configurations to little string theories. So they're nice BPS state counting problems and connections with, uh, you know, they're again secretly integer invariants and group representations hiding inside of the metrics of those manifolds. Um, and we also noticed uh, that. Poisson resumming um, a, a different number than two number of times is also possible. Uh, and so it, it seems quite likely that these yield other in, interesting instanton expansions um, with count, corresponding counting problems, but we leave that for future work. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we are very, uh, so we have to clap for uh, Max for giving such a nice talk. And uh, please unmute yourself and whoever available, please clap, clap for me. And uh, you guys can ask more questions and interact with him if you need. I have a question. Um, in the middle of the talk, you talk about the one half B flux of the K3 surface the OB4 point on the K K3 surface due to Aspen wall. Do you know like uh, how to derive this one half B, B field flux? Um, so, uh, is there any some nice pedagogical way to understand this one half uh, B field flux? At the obvious point? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, I've read the, the asking what's paper a number of times, but uh, for me, it's a kind of cryptic. Um, if there is some like a uh, easy way to understand it. So, uh, uh, f physically, the intuition you should have is that near uh so what what goes what is physically so singular about orbifolds is that um yeah. perturbation theory breaks down because you you have uh non perturbative states coming from d d two brains wrapping the collapsed two cycles which give uh -huh. you uh new massless particles which are non perturbative and so uh, 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 -huh. uh you know the non perturbative of physics is affecting the the light spectrum um uh -huh. and uh 
So, so it should be plausible then that B field will give those states mass because the B field threading the, the D2 brain is, is gonna, gonna um, affect the, the world volume of the D, D2 brain. Um, I or, see. Yeah, said another way, the, cent the central charge of the D2 brain depends both on the area of the two cycle as well as the mm -hmm. people, um, threading it. Um, and so uh, so you can see that the gauge group at those points in moduli space with B field is, is not going to be, um, is it, you'll, you'll still have an abelian gauge group uh, at those points in moduli space, uh, even, uh -huh. yeah. I see. And also, so you just, com I mean, in calculate, you, you have a way to compute this BPS spectra of this case, case resurface, ah, so M3 on K3. Can you relate this BPS spectra to some other uh, computation of the topological string on M3 on K3 times, say, whatever, some T2 or something, like a claim and a company has been done lots of computation on K3 on topological string K3. Yeah, so so topological um, string via the, um, uh, you know, usual relations like Donaldson, Thomas, Gromov, Wooden, yeah, yeah. Umar, Bafo, those are all equivalent. Uh, uh, that gives you the BPS state counts of the little string theory in, um, compactified on S1, not T2. Uh, oh, I see. Um, so, so if you want to go to, T2, then you need generalized Donalds and Thomas invariants, which vary as you move around in, in, uh, in the moduli space. Um, uh -huh. where, whereas, you know, Gromov wooden invariants are just some number, some list of numbers. Um, you don't have I wall crossing in five dimensions because the central charge is real. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. It was very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, if you guys have more questions, please ask or otherwise we have to uh, clap again for him. Uh, I have a question. I have another question. Actually. Okay, please ask, please ask. Um, so is it a fair description of what you did that what you did was to match the hypercalic quotient construction K3 with the Gaia to guide scheme more um, wall, cross, wall crossing based description? Mm -hmm. Order by order, and so far you've matched these two constructions in uh, or to first order, but you expect them to be to match to higher orders, right? So this is the plan that you're describing here. Exactly. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Any more questions or comments? Max, you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I had fun, thanks. Yeah, so see you, have a nice time and be safe and healthy. All right, have a great day everyone. Yeah. Bye.